The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast, The Forgotten Students, Understanding the Student Completion Crisis in Higher Ed and Emerging Solutions. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we move through the presentation today, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box and we will hold those toward the end of the presentation and then get to your answers. If by chance we don't get to all of your questions, we'll be sure to pull those questions out, share them with our presenters, and provide written responses, along with a link to the recording, this PowerPoint, and any resources that are shared. You can also follow along with the presentation by clicking the handout pane in the dashboard and downloading the slides. If you're active on Twitter, feel free to follow the conversation with the hashtag WCET webcast, and you can also ask your questions there. Today we'll move through panelist introductions, defining dropouts and forgotten students, discuss the completion report card, then move on to the impact of the completion crisis and approaches to bringing forgotten students back. University of Memphis will share their story, Q&A, and then we'll wrap up. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the, qu the question box, and you can also use the chat box. Today, we have a wonderful moderator, my friend Callie Morrison, who is the Associate Dean of Alternative Learning at American Public University. I'll let Callie go ahead and take it from here. Hi, Megan. Uh, you're not going to want to hear this, but I just got a blue screen of death, so I'm restarting my computer. <laughs> so I'm still on the phone. But no problem. That last minute thing that you didn't want to happen. <laughs> no problem. So we're going to so go ahead and move. we'll let the presenters do self introductions while you reboot there. So Sarah and Tracy, Thank please you. go ahead and do introductions. Sure. Thanks, Megan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Horn. I'm the CEO of Reup Education, and delighted to be here today. Uh, I have spent the last 15 years of my career focused on supporting. Uh, the completion crisis and ultimately bringing coaching and proactive student support solutions to universities across the country. And I'm excited uh, to talk to you today, not only about what REUP is doing, but also highlight the amazing work of my colleague, Tracy, at the University of Memphis. Uh, a little bit of a fun fact about me when I'm not working. Um, I love the fall, and one of the things I love about the fall is the NFL. I'm a big football fan, and growing up outside of Baltimore, I happen to be a big Ravens fan, so the week started off really well for me, uh, given that we beat the Steelers on Sunday night. However, I am uh, lamenting the success of my fantasy football team's performance. <sighs> Um, and I will let Tracy take it away. Fantastic. Tracy. Hello, everyone. My name is Tracy Robinson, and I currently have two titles. Um, on the slide here, you see Director of Innovative Academic Initiatives, and I'm transitioning to a new role as um, Interim Director of our Center for Academic Retention and Enrichment Services. So, like many of you in the audience, uh, wearing three or four hats um, currently, but uh, have been at the university for over 18 years, um, have spent a lot of time as an academic advisor um, specifically, and um, started our finish line program, which we'll talk about um, later, about five years ago, and have found it to be the best work I've ever done in higher education. Um, working to help students come back to finish their degree. Um, a fun fact about me is that uh, prior to coming to the University of Memphis, I worked for the Make-A-Wish Foundation and I got to be a fairy godmother, um, helped student or helped wishes come true for children who were suffering from life-threatening illnesses. So I think there's a little correlation, perhaps, in my current work in that I'm still helping uh, people have wishes come true and finishing their degree. So excited to share our work with you uh, today. Great. Thank you both. Enjoyed your fun facts. So Sarah, go ahead and take it. Great. Thanks. So. What you see here is most of these headlines are from just the last couple of years. Um, you know, 
But the completion crisis has received attention and scrutiny for well over a decade. And despite that, the number of students who have some college, no degree, and who are saddled with debt is a number that continues to increase. The latest metrics on stopout students suggest that there's somewhere between 35 to 37 million students with some college credit and no degree. And while you'll hear Tracy and I discuss some of the practical solutions we've implemented to help solve this problem, you'll also hear our passion that this is a moral imperative requiring the higher education industry's focus, attention, and investment. If you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, the completion report card. So nearly 70% of the universities evaluated in Neil Raisman's study received a failing grade associated with their six-year graduation rates. This is striking um, and is further evidence of the completion crisis we see in this industry. Um, I want to hand it over to Tracy so that she can chime in um, about her experience with this report card at the University of Memphis. Thanks, Sarah. Um, in starting our finish line program five years ago, uh, we had really had a real wake up call here at the University of Memphis for a couple of years prior to that. Um, I was in a unit where we were looking to specifically recruit back some adult students. And we had had a great campaign um, of getting students interested in coming back. And then we didn't really see the results of them following through. Um, and our graduation rates were still much, much lower than we wanted it to be. And we really had to stop and take a look at ourselves and think, you know, what, what can we do to stop this funnel of students who are leaving the institution? And um, as we try to work on stopping the, the funnel leaving, we also need to put some strategies together to help the students come back. Um, and as our Vice Provost, Dr. Dick Irwin said, you know, when you're looking at transcripts of students with 120 credit hours or 150 credit hours and no degree, we, we, the institution, have a responsibility to help that student come back. Leaving our institution with only student debt and no degree is no longer okay. Um, and so we are thankful to have some strategies in place to, to help all of that now. But it was a hard look for us at the institution to really accept where we were and how many students were leaving. Thanks, Tracy. So there's a number of people and groups impacted by this completion crisis. And certainly, we can talk about it at the individual level. And we can also talk about it at the university level. But there's also a big social impact to the attrition rates that we see in this country. In the last 50 years, wages for individuals who have earned their high school diploma have actually declined. Conversely, in that same time period for individuals with a bachelor's degree or higher, wages have steadily increased. So not only is the lifetime earning potential for individuals with a bachelor's degree significantly higher than folks with a high school diploma, that earnings gap appears to be widening as time goes on. And for learners who have debt and no degree, the disparity between income and earning potential is even larger. So this data highlights the continued need for both access to higher education and a focus on supporting outcomes and completion rates. While we quantify the completion crisis as it relates to the impact on students, we can also quantify this challenge as it relates to the university, as Tracy mentioned. So there's a significant monetary cost associated with student attrition. And what we often look at in report cards or in performance metrics are the graduation rates themselves or the attrition rates. What we're not often looking at is the cost to this industry. 
On average, schools lose close to $10 million a year in revenue uh, as a result of attrition. And as an industry, we're losing $16.5 billion in revenue annually due to students stopping out or dropping out. And the cost to students in the industry is not only monetary in nature. There's a significant social cost to individuals who are not able to complete their degree. These costs are often health related. And as you can see, individuals with college degrees are often in very good health and less likely to struggle with obesity or heavy drinking, as an example. Individuals with disabilities and college degrees are also more likely to be able to live independently. And overall, there's a significant reduction in the likelihood that people who have earned their degree will spend time incarcerated. So because we don't often track or understand what happens to students once they leave our institution, there are a number of myths that have been attributed to this student population because they've in large part remained a mystery and have not received the focus and attention that perhaps they deserve. And some of the biggest myths that we hear about in conversation, um, both casually and formally, are that students left or dropped out because they had academic challenges and struggled. They were not prepared. We also hear that students aren't actually interested in finishing their degree. And if they were, they either would have stayed or they would be responding to us and uh, engaging with us proactively. We also hear that students who, uh, are, who are motivated return are motivated re to return for simply extrinsic reasons. Um, you know, we at REUP learned this I would say the hard way. <laughs> so uh, while we initially focused on student stopouts and did outreach to educate these learners on how much they could earn in their lifetime if they completed their degree versus when they didn't complete their degree, we sort of uh, shared with them so much information about what we thought they didn't know. And over time, what we've done is track so much data and information. Um, and what that data and information has told us is that 85% of the students who we engage with actually do want to earn their degree and they never lost sight of this goal. What we've also heard is that primarily they wanna earn that degree for very intrinsic reasons because they've always had this goal and it is a signal to them when they will achieve it or they want to set a great example for their families and their children. So these are some of the things that we've learned may not actually be true about this population, but it's the way that these students are often spoken about. Bringing stopout students back to universities is also something that's often cited as being hard to do. And it is hard. And here are some of the reasons why it's not seamless to support and re-enroll student stopouts. Um, first, how do you find them? So the, their contact information often changes when they leave. Their cell phone number changes, they moved and they no longer have the same address. So how do you even get in front of them? And then when you get the right contact information, how do you actually engage them? Uh, you know, what messages are going to resonate with them and how do you actually get their attention? Uh, we also need to seek to understand. So why did they drop out or stop out in the first place? And what would need to change for re-enrollment to actually become an option? Uh, we have to define as an industry and as a university individually, what are the steps for a student to actually re-enroll and do they know that? Um, what we often hear from students is they want to come back, but they have no idea how. And in spite spending some time researching and trying to figure out, they reached a dead end. We also have to look closely at uh, who is supporting these students and what is it that they need to continue to move forward and ultimately accomplish their goal of earning their degree. Um, 
I want to turn it over to Tracy for a moment too and ask her to speak about some of the pilot programs that Memphis has tried. Um, I think you know she definitely has some stories about Hi. Um, yes. So we, before we launched our finish line program, we had tried two other programs prior to that of, of reaching back out to students and helping them come back. And um, what we found is that the messaging was very important for these students. There was a reason that they left the institution. Um, we thought um, in initially starting these um, campaigns that it was because of academic difficulty or perhaps low GPAs, but that wasn't the case. Um, our average GPA of, of our returning students is, has been a 2.6, um, so that, that wasn't the, the case at all. We found also that if we brought them back and told them the same thing that they already knew, um, you know, they weren't so inclined to return. They wanted to know what was different about the institution and what had changed since they left or what were we going to do to help them return. Um, I've got a good friend at Complete College America, Sarah Ansel, who says that really it's about asking the students to give the institution a second chance. It's not about us giving the students a second chance. It's quite the opposite. And so it's important that they know that there is um, an institution that cares about them, that knows perhaps why they left and what can be done to overcome those challenges. Perhaps they left for a great job opportunity and moved two states away, but your online classes or online degree completions may be an option for them that they didn't even know about. So it's making sure that the students know that you want them to come back. That means a lot to them. Back to you, Sarah. Great, thank you. Um, so, you know, what is important to remember is that much like we treat new students that we're enrolling or even students that we're trying to keep. They're not all the same type of student. Uh, but we often bundle the outreach and the coaching and support for these students either into enrollment initiatives or retention initiatives. And reaching out and stop out students is a fundamentally different type of student who requires a different cadence of support and outreach. And in addition to that, there are different personas of students within the stop out population that when you track things like what their motivation is, what their challenges are and what they need, what university resources they're interested in taking advantage of upon return and also how they want to communicate, you can find that when you may have lumped, for example, on the slide we have here about three personas, while you may have, you know, sort of lumped some women into one bucket of a married woman with two children and communicate to them that way, if you layer on the four different um, types of data that we continue to connect, you find that these are actually three different types of women who want and need different ways to engage. Um, they need different resources, and they actually want to communicate with the university and the support structures in fundamentally different ways. And so as you know, as a system, we need to think about how we're tracking information, data, and preferences to cater our communication and our outreach to students in different ways without giving them all the same label like a stop-out student. It's also important to realize that implementing these initiatives, to do it well, certainly requires uh, 
the use of technology so that we can be efficient and effective. It's also simply how people want to communicate these days, right? Most people have their phones with them within a second of reach. <laughs> um, and so you want to be mobile friendly um, and get in front of these South Africa students where they are. But you also want your outreach to be deeply human. You know, students have inertia when we get in, when we start to engage with them. It, while they've never lost sight of this goal of ultimately completing their degree, um, they have no plan and they have other priorities in their life and school is not at the top of the list. So what can you do to blend efficiency and technology with what is a deeply human science and art? Well, what we found over the last several years of engaging student stopouts is that, you know, we started almost two years ago with very standard preferences and practices like using phone and primarily using email. And we've evolved over time as we started to actually ask students, how do you want to engage with us and how do you want to hear from us? And in gathering that information and also understanding how to find them and where to find them, you can see that the majority of our interactions or almost half of our interactions are happening via text and via web form so that students can engage with us in quick ways. Um, they can engage with us on their phone. And we're still finding that those interactions are very, very personal. Um, and they're very, very uh, emotional. And just because it might not always be happening on the phone doesn't mean that we aren't understanding students and where they are and also seeking to help them set goals and move them forward. So you've heard us talk about information and data so far throughout this presentation. And that's a really, really important thing to emphasize, which is, the more data and information you collect about your student interactions and engagement, the more you can use that to ultimately understand your student's population and also predict which students are the most likely to re-enroll and ultimately graduate. And we have found that by applying predictive analytics based on a combination of demographic, academic, and behavioral data, we can ultimately better understand where to intervene with students and how to apply both our technology and our human interventions to support students and ultimately re-enroll them. One of the things that we've seen um, in almost every institution where we have uh, supported and worked with students over the last two years is that it is really important to do a deep dive and an audit of your re-enrollment process so that you can identify and eliminate barriers for students to re-enter seamlessly. Um, while they are researching their options and the opportunities that they have to ultimately re-enroll and go back to school, it is important for them to be able to find that information and understand the how as seamlessly and quickly as possible. And to also understand that most of the time, students are going to be doing that research, as I mentioned, on their phones. <laughs> and so take a look and uh, check out your website and see if the ability for your student stop to find the information they need to understand their options and the process is as seamless for them to find as you may think that it is. And again, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy so she can speak a little bit more about their fantastic efforts and programs um, at Memphis, specifically highlighting their finish line program. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for the opportunity to, to share our partnership um, with REUP. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on our program and, and how we came to work together um, as well. So the Finish Line program is a degree completion program um, that launched in the fall of 2013. 
Um, if you could move one slide forward, uh, Megan. Um, so just um, celebrating our five year anniversary um, this month. And the program specifically was designed to re-recruit uh, stop-out students who were close to finish, finishing their first bachelor's degree. So we first looked at students who had left our institution. Um, we have since broadened that reach to students who've left other institutions as well. Um, but we were specifically looking at the students who were very close to completion. I'll, um, sometimes they're called comebackers. Um, sometimes they're called uh, stopouts. It's, it's basically the same group. Um, and sometimes from an administrative perspective, they're also called um, the lowest hanging fruit. I've always cautioned those around me that sometimes the lowest hanging fruit is not the easiest to get off of the tree. Um, and that's uh, one reason why we have partnered with REUP recently um, to help us reach the students. Um, as Sarah mentioned earlier, very often the contact information for students have changed since they last left the institution. And so it's hard to find those students. And thankfully REUP is, is helping us with that. Um, just to give you a little bit of perspective of our timeline, on the next slide, you'll see, um, I've mentioned we had some earlier uh, campaigns in 2011. We tried a back on track event. We got a lot of response to students who were interested in coming back. We learned from that program since we didn't have much follow through. Um, two major lessons, and one is that the messaging is really important. Uh, for these students, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you've got to tell them that they're coming back to something different or they may not be motivated to return. And then secondly, we were um, connecting those students back with advisors in their departments. Um, many of the advisors on our campus have caseloads of three, four, five, six hundred students, and they had their hands full already. And so, we found in that um, strategy is that we needed to have point people, point uh, advisors to help those students not only return but continue through to graduation. Um, our second kind of uh, outreach campaign, we thought we have a lot of credit for prior learning opportunities on our campus. And so we thought perhaps that's the messaging that we need to tell them is that you may be able to earn credit for your things that you've been doing since you've left the institution. And so we called that campaign Experience Counts. And again, some, some relative success with that. Um, we were launching that campaign in February and very often students weren't going to return until August. And so we realized we've got to keep them engaged and working towards something uh, so that we ensure that they are coming back. Um, and so many of our prior learning options have alternative start dates. They can start at any time studying for a CLEP exam. Um, and so that was really important. And ultimately we came to the realization that many of these students had maxed out all of their federal financial aid. Um, and so one of the main reasons they weren't returning is because they didn't see a way to complete their degree and pay for it. And so when we initially launched in October of 2013, we were offering students a scholarship to return that the institution would pay for, um, a scholarship that would cover their tuition and cost related to completion. Um, and um, that has continued today. Um, we have since, we now work with students who are not on our scholarship as well. About 30% of our students currently receive our finish line scholarship. Um, and so we started out in that, in that campaign, but um, quickly realized we were gonna um, have to work with other students that still had some financial aid. And so we work with them to, to use that um, in completion. So it's a variety of, different methods that we work with to help students see not only the completion plan, but the way that they can pay for it. Um, 
by that end of that academic year, we had uh, 39 graduates in August of 2014 um, and celebrated over 500 in our summer August graduation of this year. Um, so that's a cumulative number of our graduates um, so far in the program, and we're really, really excited about that. Our specific criteria for the program um, is we work with students that have senior standing. So for us, a bachelor's is 120 credit hours. So we work with students that have 90 or more credit hours. They have been gone from the institution or another institution for at least one semester. Um, so these are, this is lost revenue for the institution that we're working to bring back. And the students do need to be in good academic standing with an overall grade point average of at least a 2.0. Um, the specific messaging that we found was important for this group is that we needed to stress that our, our program was accessible, affordable, and accelerated. Um, one of the biggest components of our program is our prior learning avenues that we have for our students. Um, we utilize uh, national exams like CLEP and DSST. We also utilize several of our own institutional um, departmental exams or challenge exams. We have a portfolio program that students can document their learning experiences through. All of these things were in place at the institution prior to this program, but the program really highlighted how students could use any of these avenues, um, and our advisors became real advocates uh, to help students find a path in prior learning if it was applicable uh, for them. The scholarship opportunity was a big change in our messaging. Um, many of these students, as I said, we started out uh, with students who had exhausted their federal financial aid. We actually got a list of those students from our financial aid department, um, and those were the students that we reached out to first. Um, but with the prior learning options, many of those come at a reduced cost. So for example, a CLEP exam can be completed for a little over $100 versus paying about $1,200 is what our tuition rate is for a three credit hour course. So even for the students that don't qualify for our scholarship, meaning that we pay for their completion, an $1,100 savings between that CLEP exam of $100 and tuition of $1,200, um, that allows students to see a path to completion even if they're paying on their own. Um, as, as an example of, of some of our uh, data that we collect, um, we've now had over 5,000 credit hours completed in our program and over 70% of those credit hours are um, completed through our prior learning options. And as I mentioned earlier, about 30% of our students are receiving our finish line scholarship. Going up to the next block, the change elements. I think I've talked about this uh, enough to know that you've really got to convince the students to give the institution another try, and those change elements are important. Perhaps it's a change in the catalog requirements, or perhaps it is a change in a, a professor who was the only one who taught a course and is no longer at the institution. Uh, perhaps it's that we can look at your transcript and see if you may be closer to finishing another degree besides the one that you first started out with. So any or all of those change elements are important to share with the student because that increases their motivation to complete. And then lastly, we really play up our completion concierge. Um, these are our academic advisors who work to help recruit the students back and then advise them on degree completion options and help them evaluate the different costs um, associated with those completions. 
and then they stay with the students until graduation. We consider these to be very high risk students since they've left the institution once or more than once. And so we want to be their concierge. We want to be the person that they come back to for any questions. Um, and we work with other departments on campus to help facilitate those uh, conversations or questions and answers um, when needed. We also wanted to look at a solutions approach. Um, so we wanted to anticipate what problems may have occurred with the students and why they may have left the institution and what we were going to do to help in those categories or reasons. Um, and you see a few on the screen. Um, some of the students left um, without having great last semesters as far as grades go. Maybe that job took over a lot of their time and they may have left those last couple of semesters with not so good grades. We're lucky to have an academic fresh start policy in the state of Tennessee and at our institution. It's sort of like an academic forgiveness. So for students who have been out of higher education institutions for at least four years, we can remove their previous um, failing grades and sort of give them a do over as far as grade point average goes which has been very crucial for our, especially our adult returning students who have been away for many, many years. Um, we also find that some of the students have prior balances, um, our issues in getting transcripts from other institutions. So we work with our bursar's office, our, our admissions office, to perhaps allow those students to at least register for the next semester, um, but then a, a temporary hold um, release. And also, um, there's nothing preventing them from starting on a CLEF exam, perhaps, if they can't get a transcript yet and have some time to pay down a prior balance, but still be making forward motion on their degree completion um, while they're taking care of those things. Um, also, our, some of our internal policies and practices got in the way of students getting to graduation, like a requirement that students have to file for graduation the semester prior to graduation. And when we recruited some of these students back, they were ready to graduate in that final semester, and they hadn't been here the previous semester to, to file that intent to graduate. So, we are lucky that we were able to collaborate with many of our own internal offices to find solutions to work around some of those things, um, which has been a huge relief for our students. So here's where we are today, five years later. Um, 526 graduates from our program and proud of each and every single one of them. You see a picture of Anisha, um, who was our first graduate that I had the chance to work with her, with her mom on graduation day. Um, Anisha is like many of our students who had left the institution and was saving up money to return um, and had been away for a couple of more semesters than she had hoped. She needed four courses to complete and we were able to work with some of her prior learning to have that evaluated um, and obviously those smiles kind of speak for themselves, but um, the thing that I always remember about Anisha, even to this day, is not only what it meant to her and to her mom, but also that she was a single mom of a two and a half year old daughter at the time. And so we know from research that having a college graduate uh, parent is going to increase the likelihood that the child completes college as well. And so for me, that is a, is a sign, a reminder that we're not only changing the lives of our graduates, but their families and our communities as well. And I know that sounds kind of sappy, but it, it's so true. And I saw it firsthand with Anisha and so many um, of our other students as well. Um, you see some of our average facts there. Um, uh, surprisingly, students have only needed 11 credit hours to, to graduate. 
and the cost for them has been $1,800 uh, for those 11 credit hours. Again, if you remember from earlier, I said three credit hour tuition course cost about $1,200. So you see the value of our prior learning options um, in that average cost. And um, even more exciting is how we're reaching some of our other populations on campus, um, specifically our first generation students and our underrepresented minorities and also our low income students. So on the next slide, you'll see that a little um, less than half of our graduates in our program have been first generation students. Um, almost 70% have been low income or Pell students and over 70% have been underrepresented minorities. And so what this screen tells me and what's so exciting about this work is that this is helping us close achievement gaps on our campus for these populations that have historically struggled to reach graduation. Um, and so this wraparound service of our completion concierge, these alternative options for students to do as soon as they're ready to return, these are really important to these populations specifically, and we're really glad of, of our work there. So that's a little bit about our program. I wanna tell you a little bit uh, before I hand it back to Sarah about the reason that we are working with REUP. Um, so we've learned a few lessons, hopefully, along the way in the five years that we've been doing this work. And one of the biggest lessons for us is the time needed to recruit these students back to the institution. Um, I have three academic advisors that work for me in this program, those completion concierge. Um, and previously, they were the recruit back uh, personnel. They were also the advisors and, and became graduation analysts along the way because they were working with the students to the point of graduation. And when we met REUP, we realized that this would be a great opportunity for us to partner with a group that's really expert in the recruit back piece. And this would allow our advisors to focus on what they do best, which is the completion part. Um, so we launched with uh, REUP just um, a few months ago, and I'm excited to say, share that we're crunching the numbers now, but we have over 100 students that REUP has helped us recruit back, both for the finish line and for our regular population of students with less than 90 credit hours um, as well. So this is a great partnership for us in that we get to do what we do best, REUP does what they do best, and in the end, the students benefit, obviously, as well as the institution. So thank you, Sarah, for your great work at REUP and for allowing us to partner on this program. Of course, um, and as everyone on this webinar heard, you guys are amazing too. <laughs> and so this is Callie, and I'm just going to jump in and say thank you both for all of the presentation. I have a bunch of questions in the queue, so I'm going to start um, with the first one, and I believe this is for Sarah. Um, Kelly is asking, could you provide the information sources for the slide number 10 on the earnings? number 11 on the lost tuition, and number 12 on the social cost. Is that something you could put in the chat box or we could send out later? Yeah, I can definitely um, get it sent out later. I don't have the sources memorized, but happy to provide that as a supplemental information. Awesome. So the next question focuses on, um, is there a set curriculum for the finish line program? And I'm, I'm not uh, sure who would like to start with that one. Hey, it's Tracy. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself for a minute there. Um, there is not a set curriculum. Um, students can pursue whatever degree path they were 
pursuing previously. And our completion concierge also look at any other um, majors that may utilize that student's curriculum. So one of the first things is a triage process and look at that transcript from top to bottom um, and allow the students to see several different degree paths um, that they can choose. Um, many of our students uh, do choose a professional studies and an interdisciplinary studies uh, curriculum here that we have at the university that's uh, flexible and accommodating uh, courses from several different majors. Um, but yeah, our completion concierge help the students look at all of their options. That's great. That was actually my follow-up question was, do you have something that um, allows students to do a general studies or professional studies bachelor's degree that kind of, you know, incorporates it, encompasses all of their um, interdisciplinary studies. So thanks for pre-answering that question. Um, sure. The next question focuses around whether or not um, you guys at the University of Memphis or at REAP, if you've heard of this in other places, give students credit for completing coursework at non-regionally accredited institutions such as Straighter Line or if they have proof, like a certificate for having completed a MOOC. Um, or taking a course through Sailor, um, Sailor Academy. Do you all allow those kinds of non-traditional credit in addition to your prior learning assessment? Yes, we do at the University of Memphis. Actually, Straighter Line and Sailor are great partners with us as well. Um, and so through the ACE, American Council on Education Credit Recommendations um, that are already set for those courses, um, then we are able to um, grant credit for our students um, here at the University of Memphis. And those are great options because students can jump into those at any point. There's open enrollment per se. Um, so if we're talking to a student that's interested in February, but our next semester doesn't start until June, um, perhaps that's something that they can go ahead and get started in, build some confidence and have success um, and continue that momentum. So yes, we're thankful for those partners as well. Yeah, and, and Sarah, I'm happy to chime in others? with what, yeah, um, across our institutions, we see a similar approach, um, especially at the institutions who um, have very traditional academic and curriculum offerings uh, when they leverage these alternative partnerships um, and ways to earn credit. It can help to reduce the overall um, cost of a student supplementing their degree or going back and earning prerequisites or even um, boosting their grade so that they have a high enough GPA to re-enroll. Uh, so those are some innovative ways that even our most traditional partners are really uh, implementing or have implemented in order to better serve this student group. That's great. Um, so I'm going to have a follow-on question here that relates also to um, kind of the major that students have chosen and what happens when they're coming back. So we have a question that asks, what do you do when students were pursuing a technology or computer-related degree that will no longer reflect the changes in technology since leaving the university? As you all know, you know, those kinds of degrees, the um, it can change daily, right? I mean, every six months at the very least, kind of those technologies are updating and changing. The skill sets are needing to change. Do you allow them to complete that degree or do you um, work with them to find something that might be a better fit for what they have now? For us at the University of Memphis, we always work with our departments to see what can and, and can't be done for the students related to curriculum accommodations. Um, that is the faculty decision in those departments to say whether the student is close enough to finishing with these additional two courses, um, or perhaps they can look at um, certifications or things that the students may have earned since they've been away from the institution. 
through prior learning um, credit. So we always work with the students and the departments to find out what the best fit is. Um, I can think of one student in particular that we had where it had just been um, so long that they had been gone that working with the department, we figured out it was better for them to go ahead and complete an interdisciplinary studies degree as their bachelor's. Um, and then the student entered the master's degree in that department to have sort of a more updated curriculum and, and knowledge base. Um, and so that worked good for that student um, and, and good for the department because they had a master's student out of it as well. That's great. Uh, Sarah, I'm gonna come back to you on this one. Can you speak a little more about student preferred messaging format over time? and how that data was collected? Sure, um, happy to do that. So, um, you know, I think it's maybe important to put into context, um, you know, some of the background of, of where these results and, and data comes from, which is, uh, you know, REUP is partnered with over 22 colleges and universities across the country. Um, we've collected over half a million data points from student interactions. We've recorded over 50,000 phone calls and transcribed those. Um, and uh, we've re-enrolled over 4,000 students back to school in the last year and a half. And so where this data comes from, of course, is it is having this unique focus on stopout students exclusively, and also paying unique attention to uh, not necessarily assuming that just because we're focused on stopouts that we as a company are the experts. So the first thing that we've implemented is to actually ask the students, <laughs> how do you wanna hear from us? Um, and we collect that information in a variety of ways, um, mainly on web forms. You can see we, you know, implemented that about, you know, six to eight months into us being operational. Um, and that has helped to drive uh, our understanding of additional uh, technologies and services that we needed to implement as a company in order to better match the wants and needs of the student population. Um, we also have take an approach to uh, empower the students to drive this process. So students get, uh, you know, pretty repeated messages and communications from REUP and from their success coach. And they have the power to see their coaches calendar, set up meetings at mutually convenient times, um, and also text and chat with their coach when it convenient for them. So we really um, try to make this as student-centered as possible, but as you also heard, we're an extremely data-driven organization, um, and we collect as much information as we can from the students that is both quantitative and qualitative in nature, which has informed um, some of our approaches and changes. That's great. So um, I'm gonna have one more question. I think we have time for that. Um, so what do students typically want to know from you when you speak to them for the first time? What's that burning question they ask? Sure, um, I'm happy to chime in uh, from the re-up perspective and then uh, Tracy, you can take it. Um, we inevitably, no matter what the institution, hear three questions from students uh, right out of the gate. And what they want to know is, uh, how long is it going to take me to complete my degree? How much is it going to cost me? And what does the process look like? And what we have found is the faster and more accurate we can get the answers to those questions in the student's hands, the more excited and motivated they remain and they stay, and the more likely they are to continue engaging and ultimately re-enroll and persist. 
That is exactly the three questions that we hear at the University of Memphis also. So um, exactly. Awesome. Um, and I, you know, from my research, it's not surprising to me as well. In projects I did both when we were at WC, when I was at WCC, and then um, as I've moved on, that's kind of the 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 big three I think for everyone. I don't have any more questions in the chat box, but I'd like to say if you would each have a um, one thing that everyone should take away from this, could you take like 30 seconds and say what is your number one takeaway, and then we'll turn the panel back over to Megan for the closing slides. Great. Thank you so much, Callie, for moderating today and being with us. Thank you to Sarah and Tracy for sharing your stories. I think it was a really insightful webinar and the data was very compelling. And we look forward to sharing sources on some of those slides that were referenced earlier in the presentation. So if this is your first introduction to WCET, visit our website to learn more about our focus areas, the initiatives that we manage, and um, we have lots and lots of great resources on our website. Consider joining our community. We have a very active membership community. Our annual meeting, which is our 30th annual meeting, is coming up just in a few weeks in Portland, Oregon. Registration is still open for that. We have a few spots remaining. You won't want to miss it. View the program. All of our webcasts are archived and are accessible on our WCET link there under webcast as well as our YouTube channel. The webcast was recorded and you will see receive a link to the recording shortly after this presentation. I want to do a quick shout out to our supporting members as well as our annual sponsors that underwrite much of our programs and events here at WCET. Without them, it wouldn't be possible to do the level of work that we continue to do. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for your questions and your involvement. And we'll see you on the next webcast, which is actually on Thursday, coming up here on October 4th. And that's going to be a conversation with several community college leaders around what they would do if they could re hit the reset button on their online learning programs. So that'll be a great discussion and again open to all. Enjoy your afternoons. Thanks so much for being here.